People are moving away from any kind of austerity. They want warmth, they want emotion. And Monk is the perfect artist for that. And if you think about how the scream was considered, it was like a joke, an absolute joke. And now the scream has become like a metaphor for the times that we live in. And that's how seriously Monk is taken now. It's such a pleasure to be here today with you in the, in the studio and, and, and we're going to be filming and talking about your work and, and particularly your work in this wonderful exhibition of yours at the Royal Academy, Tracy M. in Edvard Munch, The Loneliness of the Soul. You know, we're going to be joined also by, by Simon also in his very creative space in New York as well, who's our kind of resident Munch man. Really. Yes, he's, I know, he's, he's, he's man York, Munch. Literally our man Munch. And most particularly on the two pictures that we've got the privilege of selling in March, which come from this fantastic family, the Ollison family, who've got a long distinguished history collecting the artists. I was keen to start, Tracy, really by talking about your love of Edvard Munch and and specifically how that started. I was a big David Bowie fan and a friend of mine told me that Lodger and Heroes were based on Egon Schiele paintings. So I went to the only bookshop in Cliftonville and they had a little art section and they had a section on expressionism and I pulled it out and in this book was Edvard Munch. Right. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. And Monk become my favourite artist. And then I wrote my art thesis on Monk. It was called My Man Monk. Monk was such an instinctive painter. And when I look at things like this self-portrait, I don't just look at the image of the man himself, but I think that technique is incredible. He used all these degla colours, like bright pink, lime green. You know, it was amazing. And people were kind of like horrified by right. it. It's like like punk rock, I said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a great analogy. Yeah, yeah. Well, I loved actually the punk rock comparison actually because Munch was just was incredibly kind of single-minded bloody-minded about you know doing exactly what 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 he wanted to do a real rebel a very kind of direct break the rules unmediated approach to expression exactly it had that kind of effect he was so radical and the amazing thing also I mean Simon you know I'd love to hear from you some more biographical detail about this it's very difficult to kind of really appreciate today just how innovative he really was the two pictures that we are selling in London later this month um, really give a very interesting kind of dialogue on that the self-portrait from 1926 he's 62 he's one of the most famous artists in the world He's holding his palette in a way that we might expect from Goya or Rembrandt even, reaching back into art history to present himself in this very forthright way. And I think when you look at a picture like the self-portrait of 1926, there's again a kind of ambivalence here. This is a very public-facing portrait of a professional artist at a moment when he's getting international recognition. I like this painting because I think you can actually see writing in it. He was such an avid writer. He wrote poetry, he wrote prose. When you look in the hills, you can almost see some kind of message. His poetry is just so beautiful and and amazing. When did you first go and see great monk paintings in person? Well, first of all, Monk wasn't very well represented over the last sort of like 30 years because Monk was like a bit of a joke. And then right now, the right person to show is Monk because everybody needs real solace, everybody needs emotion. So I'm really happy for Monk as I'm very happy for me because I also think 20 or 30 years ago, I was a joke too. And now I'm not. Now people are starting to understand what I was talking about. I think, Tracy, in in your work, like in Monk's, we feel you in the brushstroke, in the materiality of the the paint. And if you look at a picture like Summer Day, it's almost as if the the loaded brush, it's kind of a a, a cipher for Monk himself. When I look at those two figures, the embrace figures, I actually see a kind of calming, very innocent kind of scene, but there's something much darker going on as well. You're so (laughs) naive, This is a commission for a children's nursery. Max Linder in Lübeck in Germany commissions this. In fact, Munch was a very successful child portraitist in Germany, crazy as that sounds today. Linder decides that this is not really the most appropriate imagery for his his kid's bedroom. Munch takes them back, and what he does at that point is adds these two spectral ghostly figures on the left, and that takes what is actually, on the surface of it, a very happy, joyful, sunny summer day, and adds a 
very different element, a sense of foreboding and anxiety that, that, that we associate with Munch from, from those years. How do you react to this, this picture, Tracy? Because it's got those two things, hasn't it? With the embrace, I've always thought that she'd had an abortion or a miscarriage and then he was, he was comforting her. I've never right. thought it was anything else other than that. She's crying. She seems startled too, don't you think? Absolutely, Ollie. And I think Tracy's point is a very interesting one because, I, look, all of Munch is about Munch. Whether it's a, you know, explicitly a self-portrait, everything is about not what things look like, but the way it feels to be Edvard Munch in that moment. You don't need to paint yourself to make a self-portrait. You can use objects, colours to represent how you're feeling. And that's something I find in your work too, Tracy, right? You're kind of bouncing off the external world to figure out how you're feeling inside. That's ab absolutely true and I've always said that about my work and people have always accused me of being narcissistic and this and that, and whatever, whereas I'm not. I'm just bearing witness to my feelings and so I'm being really, really honest. It's like a cycle of things that go through me. It's like what Monk said, it's like the blood. It's as it flows through my heart, through my mind and then it comes out through my fingers. I think one word that's at the very heart of, of both your work and, and Monk's is authenticity. It's not the work itself that, that it's about, it's that, you know, what he's going through in, in painting that, that picture. Do you get a similar feeling? Art should have a power and be real, like kind of vibrate. Before I start painting, when I know I'm really going to paint, the sort of power in me and the energy almost scares me. It frightens me. I know I could pick someone up and throw them across the other side of the room or whatever, you know. The first time I went to the Tate, remember I love Edvard Munch, Egon Schiller, etc. I saw uh, Rothko's um, pink and yellow painting and I sat there and, and I looked at it and I burst out crying. I didn't like abstract painting. I didn't know who Rothko was. I had no idea what I was looking at but I felt it, it resonated with me. I could feel it vibrating to the point that it made me cry. And that's what we need in art. If we feel something, when yeah, we see as long it, as it's got the power and it's got it has the a power. That's what Monk was interested in. That's what Monk was about. When you sat down to put The Loneliness of the Soul together several years ago, you've been working on this, this show, I think. Of course, nobody could have predicted that the doors would open at a time of, of global pandemic. The issues we've all been grappling with at home, anxiety and, and, and sickness, has meant that this show is an incredibly profound one on levels that, that nobody could have foreseen. Never has there been a more relevant exhibition in London, I don't think. I quite Thank agree, you. Simon. I quite agree. Thank you. As sad and disappointed I am about the show being closed and everything, you know, I understand totally why, but when I walked around on my own, because I'd been so ill with the cancer and everything, and I didn't think I was going to make it, I thought, well, at least I've got to see my show. <laughs> it's like, this is, I wasn't expecting this, so this is like all good, yeah. it's all positive, you know. It's a dream come true. Well, we hope lots of people see the show. Can you tell us just a brief word before we close about, about the mother sculpture you've been working on? I entered a competition for a large monumental sculpture to stand in front of the Munch Museum. I made a small maquette, and it was called The Mother, and it's actually my mother and she's facing out towards the field welcoming people in and at the same time she's protecting the Munch Museum she's looking after Munch. I think that that's a beautiful and, and very fitting subject that you've created at the opening of this wonderful new museum it's going to be the biggest single artist museum in the world I believe it's a big year for, for Edvard Munch and I know that down the line this self-portrait's been requested for a Munch portrait show at the National Gallery in London in 2025. So I think that the interest in Munch is just going to continue to, to grow and grow in the coming years. Yeah. Well, and as it is in, with you as well, Tracy, and your work as well. So thank you so much, Tracy. This has been absolutely riveting. It's been wonderful to spend time with you and equally in the hallowed space of yeah. your, your studio. And thank you very much indeed. Thank you. It's been brilliant. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Simon. Thanks, Tracy. I can't believe you're wearing your slippers because I took mine off just for you. <laughs> he called me to ask me what yeah, he should no, wear before. I, I put my clothes on for you because I had my pyjamas on. <laughs> Brilliant.